morning and welcome and those online we welcome you as well and uh, we trust that you will be encouraged and challenged as we meet together this morning and it's kind of nice you're all you know on either side at least I can do this so we'll just <laughs> am I not a natural bobblehead I don't know <laughs> you weren't okay all right so for announcements this morning, just take your bulletins, just a couple of things I want to highlight. Um, hopefully everybody has one. 
your uh, events for the week are listed there this week at Salem. And uh, upcoming events, Wednesday, May the 10th. Uh, just a brief business meeting after the Bible study and prayer meeting. So it's in regards to the roof repairs uh, that we had been chatting about last meeting. And uh, there was a lot of discussion around that. And so we want to try and narrow things down just a little bit. So that's Wednesday, May the 10th. And then Sunday, May the 14th, will be Salem's 40th anniversary. And there will be other announcements coming up as to what is going to take place, what events there will be, etc., um, for that weekend. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7 and verse 9 reads like this. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, what? Do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Let's take our hymn books, please, and turn to number 648. 648. There is no screen this morning technical issues. So let's, if you are able, let's stand and we'll sing Love Divine, All Love Success. so much before you are seated. Turn to your right, turn to your left, wave and smile. <laughs> All right, hymn number 105. Hymn number 105. We will glorify and we'll remain seated for this.
I invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, please. And we're going to go to Psalm 146. Psalm 146. And as we did last week, you can remain seated and uh, just follow along as I read and listen to the words of this psalm. Psalm 146. The psalmist begins by saying, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien or the stranger and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen, indeed. Well, let's just look to the Lord in a moment of prayer as we gather this morning. Father God, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here again today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together, to praise your name together, to encourage one another, to uh, be challenged by your word. And we just pray, Father, that as we gather here this morning for these few moments, that your spirit would have his way in each and every life and each and every heart that is here and watching online. Father, may his, your spirit guide us and, and lead us as we learn from you this morning. We pray, Father, that you would, through your spirit, continue to strengthen us and and encourage our hearts. We thank you for watching over us. We thank you for your provisions and, and the, um, the way that you work in each of our lives, the way that you bring healing, the way that uh, you give us direction when sometimes we just don't know where to go or we just don't know what to do. You give us the direction that we need and the understanding as we move forward. Father, we just thank you for this church body. We thank you for providing for this church body over the years. And you have been so faithful in that. And we say thank you and praise you this morning for that. Father, um, we just pray that you would watch over Pastor Paul and Betty Lynn this morning as they're in Ontario and, and at a conference, but also visiting. And so we pray that this would be an opportunity for them to be able to decompress a little bit, um, but also be able to learn and be challenged um, as they attend the conference. So we just want to commit them to you, give them safety there, and give them safety as they travel back to us soon. And we would just want to commit them to your care today. Father, we pray for those uh, in the Drew today. We just pray your blessing on them. We pray for encouragement in their hearts. We pray for strength in their bodies. Uh, protect them, Father, from all the bugs that are going around. And we just pray that you would just be uh, an encouragement to them there. Guide the staff as they work with them, Father. We commit them to you, them to you today. We would ask for, Father, folks in our own congregation, uh, our own members and, and adherents that uh, are suffering today with an illness, um, something in their body, you know what it is, Father, and so we just place them in your care. We place this request at your feet, knowing that you will look after it and that you would bring healing and strength to them. Again, we just want to thank you, Father, for the way you move amongst us, and we pray that... Uh, that we would honor and glorify you in everything that we say, 
and everything that we do, and we will give you praise for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. One more hymn, one more hymn, number uh, 123. 123. We'll remain seated for this as well. I think you guys know. folks so much. Well, Pastor Paul, if you're watching, your people may be out before noon. <sighs> so sorry. <laughs> All right. So take your Bibles and let's flip to James chapter 1, please. James chapter 1. And I want us to continue our travel through these first few verses of James chapter 1. And what we find in these few verses, verses we dealt with verses 1 through 4 last week. We're going to deal with verses 5 through 8 this week and uh, finish off that little section. But I think we found out last week very clearly that this is an important passage for all who know and love Christ. And the question we asked last week, which I'll ask this morning, is how do you react in the midst of a trial? <laughs> and if we went around the room this morning, I'm sure we would get a whole whack of different answers as you would share those with me. And I know that's true. Because we all act a little differently. Some of us freak out, right? You know, trial comes and it's like, ah, and that's it. We're done, finished, we're gone. Um, others are very calm about it. You know, they are able to think it through. They're able to deal with it in a totally different way. I read this a number of years ago. One writer put, uh, put this down. I thought it was brilliant, actually. It says, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as unsolvable problems. True? It is. It's true. We're all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as unsolvable problems. Because when a trial comes, we look at it and we go, what in the world am I going to do next? And as you sit there, to you it may seem unsolvable. Because you can only see the here and now, right? God brings a trial into your life and he sees way down the road. And he says, I'm going to allow this to happen. I'm going to bring this into this individual's life. And I know what I want to accomplish. <laughs> we have no idea. Right? It's, we just have no idea as this thing comes our way. You've experienced them. I have experienced them. And at times they seem like there's a wall or walls, plural, all around us. And there's absolutely no exit. 
the end of the world. <laughs> the end of the world as we know it, right? And actually, according to Scripture, we find that they are described in many senses as great opportunities for us. And they arrive at the worst times, right? They, do, they don't arrive, you know, like it, they should be scheduled. You know, I have a trial for you, God would say. I have a trial for you. Well, sorry, God, can't be this week. This week's out of the question. Too many things to do. Next week, I have a couple of days free. Tuesday, Thursday would be great. You know, just give me a heads up on Tuesday if it's coming, just so I can prepare myself. But that isn't the way God works. They arrive at the worst times. We're not certain of what's going to happen. But I will say this, they are built into the framework of your being, built into the framework of your life to keep us living on the level of endurance, to keep us living on the level of increased faith, moment by moment and day by day. We do not have a promise of full restoration in this life. We do not have a promise that we will be free from all afflictions in this life. I don't find that anywhere in Scripture. If you can find it, let me know, and we'll deal with it. But I don't see that. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And in verses 1 through 6 of, of chapter 12, 2 Corinthians, you remember this passage? Paul's thorn in the, Paul's vision, first of all, right? God gives him a vision. And then we hear about his thorn in the flesh. So he's already given Paul the vision in verses 1 through 6. And in verse 6, he says, Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Verse 7. To keep me from being conceited, or from becoming conceited, because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. A flesh. Have no idea what that is. I don't. There's speculation about it. And some people will say this and that. I have no idea. So I say, we don't really need to know. Doesn't matter. It's a thorn in the flesh. We have them every day. He says, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And you can almost hear Paul say, I can't do this. Can't do this. Just wake up another day and it's like, I, can't, I, I don't know if I can do this. Lord, just take it away. I pleaded with the Lord, take it away. But he said to me, what? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now look at the rest of that. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. I think that covers them all, does it not? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. But I love that verse. My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. God gives us that promise. Last week we dealt with verses 1 through 4. And um, just to review, we looked at being in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the difficulty. And there were three things that we chatted about. Number one was, how are we to approach the trial? What's verse 2 say? Consider it all joy. Consider it, NIV says, pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 
So we are to approach them with a joyful attitude. We are to realize or come to a realization that God is in control of the trial and he and and the trial accomplishes an increased endurance in our life. The trial accomplishes an increased strength in our life. The trial accomplishes an increased faith in our life. And it will never destroy true faith. He promises that. It will never destroy true faith in him. So we approach the trial, as difficult as it may be, approach the trial with a joyful attitude. Because you ultimately look to see what God is going to do. You don't know what he's going to do, but he promises that he will increase our faith, he will increase our strength, he will increase our endurance. So if you know that, then you approach it with a joyful attitude because you know whenever it may end, if it does, down the road, you will be better than you were at the beginning, right? So have that joyful attitude. Secondly, verse 3, he says, Because you know, or know this, that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So we have a joyful attitude, and then we have to have a mind that understands what God is trying to do. Know this. Consider the reason behind the trial. It produces endurance. It produces our faith. And without trials, would it accomplish that? Would anything accomplish that if we didn't have a trial? Because we would just go along. This is great, right? Travel along in our Christian journey and say, this is just wonderful. And there would be no impetus. <laughs> Big word, but nothing to kind of kick us, right, and say we need to have faith and trust in God through this and allow him to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. There would be nothing to strengthen us to endure. So have a joyful attitude, understand why this trial is there, and thirdly, verse 4, he says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Allow it to do its work, he says. Have a submissive will to him. Allow the trial to come. Allow it to bring endurance. Let endurance bring perfection. Let endurance bring maturity. Let it do what God wants it to do in your life. And boy, as a human... As a human, I go, ugh. But you, I mean, that's what God wants us to do. And if you're a child of God, he will do what? He will walk with you through this trial, correct? So we don't have to do it on our own. Somebody wrote this. God didn't remove the Red Sea. He parted it. And sometimes God doesn't remove your problems. He makes a way through it. It's true. We looked at the passage last week where, you know, he says he will provide a way of escape. And that's when people go, Ooh, pluck you out of it. And God's saying, no, not necessarily. There may be times when I do, as I mentioned last week, there may be times when I do. I will just reach down and I will just take you out of that trial because it's accomplished what it needed to accomplish at that point. And there's some times when that is not the case. So we need to allow the trials to humble us, to help you concentrate on eternal things, to enable you to help others in trials. Another good reason, right? You've been through it. You have, you have been there. What's the, what's the phrase? Been there, done that? You've been there, you, you've seen what God can do, and so you have the ability then to come alongside of somebody else who's maybe going through a similar trial to you, and you have the opportunity to come alongside of them and say, this is what I've learned, this is what I did. So the trial can humble you, it can cause you to have greater strength for greater usefulness, and my encouragement, James's encouragement here in this passage is to allow it to do what God wants it to do in your life. 
Today I want us to look at a couple of things. I want us to look, we're going to look at verses 5 through 8, but we're going to look at the attitude necessary, first of all, as we go through the trial, and then the resource that he gives us as we go through the trial. So first of all, the attitude necessary is a believing heart. We have to have a believing heart. When we go through the trial, we have to believe that God is there, number one. We have to believe that God will do what he has promised he will do as we go through this. So let me read verses 5 through 8 for you. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. As I mentioned earlier, trials can overwhelm us at times, and there are times when we say, I cannot handle this. And maybe we try to keep the joyful attitude. Maybe we try to have an understanding mind as we're going through. We, we try desperately to have a submissive will and say, okay, like, if this is what you want to accomplish, yet oftentimes we still don't understand what is happening. And we lack the wisdom and power to do the things that we need to do. And sometimes I entitled it help. Help. Sometimes we do that, right? We just sit there and we go, help. Because we don't know what else to say. We need the trial for wisdom. We need insight to face the issues that are in front of us. And God needs you to give more than just our human faculties to work with. He has to give us more than just those human faculties because oftentimes we think we can do it. You know, we sit down and we do the charts and we do the flow charts and we do whatever, you know, we, we do or what we've learned in school to try and figure out which is the best route to go and, and which will work, you know, so that we can get out of this thing. And sometimes it's none of that, right? <laughs> yeah, you've been there. Sometimes it's none of that. So let's look at verse 5. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, what should he do? Ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. Wisdom needed for the, uh, for the trial. The understanding needed to live life to the glory of God. The ability to view life from God's vantage point. You want wisdom? It's promised in the midst of the trial. God promises to give it. And the only way to understand the trial and to cope with the trial, the only way to respond to the trial properly and see it from his perspective is to say, God, I need your wisdom as I travel through this difficulty, through this trial, because I have no idea what I'm supposed to do or what's going to happen. Let's jump back to the Old Testament to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. And you know where I'm going. Don't you? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3. Starting at verse 5. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and shun evil. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trials have a way of enhancing our prayer life, do they not? They drive you oftentimes to your knees. They drive you to call on God. That hints the help. You know, if that's all you can get out, then that's all he needs because he knows. He knows. We noticed last week, remember we just briefly touched on Job? He was looking for answers to what was happening in his life. All of these things were being taken away. And we went through the list. 
Some of his friends gave him answers, but wrong answers. And he came to a point where he realized that answers were only available, the right answers were only available at the hand of God. And let's go to Job 28. Job 28. Job 28. And Job writes something interesting here. Um, let's see where I want to go with this. I'll, I'll start at verse 1 only because I want to give you a bit of the context here. So it starts, Job 28, verse 1. There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Man puts an end to the darkness. He searches the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Far from where people dwell, he cuts a shaft. In places forgotten by the foot of man, far from man, he dangles and sways. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as fire. Sapphires come from its rocks, and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows that hidden path. No falcon's eye has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it, and no lion prowls there. Man's hand assaults the flinty rock and lays bare the roots of the mountains. He tunnels through the rock. His eyes see all its treasure. He searches the sources of the rivers and brings hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Now, goes through great lengths to say man searches everywhere for wisdom and he cannot find it. Where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? Man does not comprehend its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. We go to incredible lengths for, for wealth, for wisdom. Look at verse 12. I just read verse, sorry, I just read verse 12. Where does understanding dwell? Man does not comprehend its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. The sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighted in silver. It cannot be bought with the gold of Ophir, with precious onyx or sapphires. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention. The price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of Cush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way of it, uh, the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it, and he said to man, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. Wow. Is wisdom available in the world? No, it is not. Not godly wisdom, only from God himself. And as we encounter a trial, Scripture says, plan to go to God. <laughs> it is God who gives wisdom. It is God who gives understanding. And a trial drives us or should drive us to depend on God. And if the trial does not drive us to God, if it does not enrich your prayer life, if the, then the trial, and I put may here, because then the trial may continue until we learn to do that and trust in God. The source of wisdom is there. We just need to access that source. Someone had written this motto a number of years back. You ready? It says, unless there is within us that which is above us, we will soon yield to that which is around us. I'll read it again. Unless there is within us that which is above us, we will soon yield 
to that which is around us. We need to ask for wisdom, and he gives it. He gives within us what is above us so that we may look at things that are going on around us with a little bit of the perspective of God. It's true. So he says we need to have a believing heart. We need to trust, have faith, and we need to ask for wisdom. Let's look at a couple things about God as we travel down through this passage in James chapter 1. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. It says he gives to how many? All. He gives to all. God is good, is he not? He is. He is good. James chapter 1, verse 17, just jump down. It says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He's a generous God. He's a gracious God. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6. I'll just read that. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom. It's from God. It's from God. And he pours it out to us. We ask and he gives to all. And folks, that is a promise with your name on it. As you sit here this morning or wherever you are online, that is a promise with your name on it. He gives to all. Look at what else he does. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives, what? Liberally, generously. He's a gracious God. He gives liberally, unconditional. It's, he gives freely. He gives generously. He will do it. It is unrestricted giving. He holds nothing back without reservation. He gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. And it does not stop. It says he gives generously and it says it will be given to him. No wisdom needed for the believer's perseverance through a trial is ever withheld from that believer that asks him for it. It's a promise. He provides everything you need, and he doesn't hold back or find fault. He does not say, oh, sorry, sorry, you, you were just here yesterday. I don't know. I don't know. Don't know if I can do it. You were just here yesterday. He doesn't say that at all. He never scolds you for coming. I've already told you this several times. Have you not read it? What do you not understand? <laughs> no, that would be apparent. They would say that. <laughs> He doesn't do that. He never scolds. And as often as you come, he will always be there for you. He says what? Ask. Ask. Is there a condition for asking? Yes, there is. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. He gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, it says. We ask in faith, but we ask in faith believing. God, this is what I know about you. This is what I've read about you. This is what I've, I have experienced about you. And so I'm asking, believing. Believing. It's a confident prayer. There's no doubt. It's a genuine trust. It's not doubting the available supply and power of God. It's not doubting his purpose. It's not doubting his will. It's unwavering faith. But we're human. <laughs> yes, we're a child of God, but we're human. And in those moments, 
sometimes we go not so sure if I can get through. James says, believe God. He is sovereign. He is loving. James says, go in prayer. Believe he will supply everything we need for the trial. And our pattern should be, give it to God. Lay it at his feet without any doubting, knowing that he can solve it, continually calling on him for, for wisdom. That's what we ought to do. But there are times when we don't do it. When we don't do it. Uh, Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. And verse 21. Matthew 21, 21. I'll give you a little bit of the context here. I'll read verse 18 um, of Matthew 21. Early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, um, he was hungry, seeing a fig tree by the road. This is Jesus now. He went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to the mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. One commentator said, qualified faith moves the muscles of omnipotence. Yeah. Qualified faith moves the muscles of omnip omnipotence. What we have to realize is as well, this is not a blank check with God. It's not a blank check. He doesn't say, I, I don't want you to ask for me to fulfill your desires. Because according to the passage, it's in the will of God, right? It's in God's will. It must line up with bringing glory to the Father. But it is in God's will. And we find out what God's will is when we what? Go to his word. And he outlines it in his word. What his will is for our life, right? We're to be faithful to him. We're to trust in him. We're to follow him. We're to have our lives lined up with, with what he wants for us as believers. John 14, uh, verses 13 and 14. Let me just quickly read that for you. John 14, verses 13 and 14 says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The context is, not only in that passage, but the context in his word says, He will do it, but it has to be in line with his will, right? Right? has to be in line with his will. The praying disciple using the power of faith will see God work suddenly and dramatically. I mean, Matthew 21, 21 said, what? If you say to the mountain, go into the sea, what? It'll do it. Figure of speech, yes. But he's saying, you will be able to do mighty things. Remember the, the parable of the mustard seed? Right? Mustard seed faith, the smallest of seeds, but when it grows, grows into a big bush. You know that. We need to have the faith that starts small but perseveres and grows larger as you are going to see great movements of God in your life and in response to your prayer. Be persistent, ever increasing. Have that ever increasing trust in God lined up with his will. And when that is true, it brings wisdom needed for the trial, James says. 
In the midst of a trial, a believing heart cries out for help, and we have to remember he allowed it for his purpose, and we need to believe then that he will give you the wisdom to endure and bring you to a point where you are better than you could have ever been before you endured the trial. He wants to accomplish so many things in us. He wants us to mature in our faith and in our trust in him. But also in verse 6 it says, but when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. He says, don't vacillate. Don't be like the sea that's back and forth. You're never, never able to settle. You're encouraged one moment, discouraged the next. You're so unstable, it seems, back and forth. Verse 7 says, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. It says there's no sense in such a person supposing he will receive anything from the Lord because you're, you go into this trial never knowing the resolution, what the resolution is available through faith and persistent trusting prayer in God. You're back and forth. You're back and forth. never realize that the resolution is available. When you do not believe that God is in control, you do not come to him as the sovereign of the universe in the midst of the trial, and you will only end up in depression and despair. Verse 8, he is double-minded, unstable in all he does. One who says, oh, I believe in God, and then the trial comes and you go, oh, but I don't know what to do, right? Waver back and forth, receive nothing. Unstable, literal translation can be too sold. You're double-minded. You don't know which way to go. You don't know what to do. Two minds, divided behavior, trusting, not trusting. And he says, don't, don't go into it like that. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. So in verses 5 through 8, it says, as you go into a trial, the way to endure that trial is to ask for and receive God's divine wisdom. You go to God, you have confidence that he gives freely, and you never debate. And you realize as you go through scripture that he never holds back anything but gives you exactly what you need to endure that trial. And what is the condition? The condition is real faith, unwavering faith, not like the troubled sea vacillating back and forth where you're caught in the middle. Such double-mindedness will, will, will make you unstable in every area of your life. But true stability in your walk with God comes to those who trust God in the midst of every trial. You've heard of Andrew Murray, correct? Yeah, theologian back, well, you guys weren't around then. Of course, John might have been. 1895-ish, uh, somewhere around there. <laughs> Sorry, John. It's just, with your glasses down on the end of your nose, it just lent itself to that. So Andrew Murray was a, was a brilliant theologian, um, and in 1895, he was in England. He was suffering from a terribly painful back, the result of an injury that he had incurred years before. And the story is told that one morning while he was eating breakfast in his room, his hostess told him that a woman had come in downstairs who was in great trouble. She wanted to know if Andrew Murray had any advice for her, how he could help her. So he handed the hostess a paper that he had been writing on, and he said, give this paper to her. This advice I'm writing for myself, but it, she may find it helpful. This is what he wrote. He said, in times of trouble, say, first he brought me here. It is by his will I am in this place. In that I will rest. Next. He will keep me here in his love and give me grace in this trial to behave as his child. Then say, 
He will make the trial a blessing in teaching me lessons he intended for me to learn, working in me the grace he means to bestow. Last, say, in his good time, he can bring me out again, how and when he knows. Therefore, in summary, say, number one, I am here by God's appointment. Number two, I am here in his keeping. Number three, I am under his training. Number four, I am here for his time. When it is finished, he will know. Wow. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 says this, and I'll, I'm going to read it from two versions, the NIV, which I'm using, of course, but then I want to read you a, a different translation, which I just love. But the, the NIV says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Good News Translation says this. I, I just, it, it, a pastor friend of mine, I think, had put it up and it popped into one of my Facebook feeds. Anyway, same verse. This small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory much greater than the trouble. That's the attitude, right? That's the attitude. Again, we serve an awesome God? We do. And for those who know and love him, he has these promises for us as we enter these trials that he, without question, will bring into our lives, whether we like it or not. Because <laughs> he has stuff to accomplish in us, correct? He does, and he will continue to do it. Hymn number 748, please. Hymn number 748. And if you are able to stand, please do so. I am his and he is mine. Let's see.
Father God, if we know and love Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we are yours and you are ours. And Father, we just thank you for that promise that you are there for us every day, every moment of every day. You will guide us as we need guidance. You will give us strength when we need strength. You will help us to have wisdom when we need wisdom. And through all the things that we will encounter day after day, you will walk with us through each of these things. And we praise you for that. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for leading us. And we pray that you would lead us now as we leave this place, that you would uh, continue to protect us, keep us well, bring us back together again. And just ask for your blessing on each of these folks. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.